Here are two basic principles to get the most out of your New Testament Bible study. Two basic principles. I tell you, it'll revolutionize your Bible study. Number one, know the writers of the New Testament. Understand who they are and what their intended purpose was and how they got their information. This will change everything. Number two, you need to have some great outside resources to help you with the biblical text. So I'm going to tell you about these two principles. And I guarantee you, if you listen to what I'm telling, it's really going to help you out to gain some great insight into the Bible. Number one, know the writers, right? So we have the Bible is broken down, talking about the New Testament into a couple of places. Number one, you get Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are the Gospels. These are the first four books. Then you get the book of Acts. And then you get the epistles and Revelation at the end. It's very powerful Well, and the book of Hebrews. So how does this work? Well, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these writers are different than what you're going to see on the back half of the New Testament. So what do we get in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Well, Matthew is known to be possibly that tax collector. That is the the idea behind his writing is Matthew. Now, I'll tell you this, the critics won't give credit to that being Matthew. Where do we get these names, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Well, we get them from the late first century, early second century. Those like Polycarp, Irenaeus, Papias, these individuals were eyewitnesses to those that were eyewitnesses. So in other words, they are the first to lay out the Gospels, according to Matthew, according to Mark, according to Luke, and John, and likewise. That's really where we get those titles from. But these individuals in the late first century, early second century, they knew folks that knew them. They knew the community of believers from the first century that were the ones that held on to these documents and began that uh, tedious process of uh, copying it. So that, that's where we get it from. But what do we get in Matthew? Well, Matthew is an eyewitness to Jesus. He is an eyewitness to Jesus. Now, these eyewitnesses to Jesus are broken up into two categories. One are the eyewitnesses that were with Jesus from the days of John the Baptist. And when they say that from the beginning, you'll see this a couple of times in the biblical text. What they're talking about is from the beginning of Jesus's ministry, which started after the baptism of John. Well, Jesus had a group of people that were with him, that followed him, that became his followers, hence his disciples, that are more than just the 12. Well, they were with him from the beginning all the way to his execution in Jerusalem, and they were eyewitnesses to his resurrection. That group of eyewitnesses is about 120. We read about that as Peter discourses in Acts chapter 1. He talks about these eyewitnesses, and that group numbered about 120. Well, Matthew is one of them. He is one that was there from the beginning, as well as he was also a witness to the resurrection. So Matthew is going to give you his eyewitness account of Jesus. Now, you've got to understand this. What does this mean, his eyewitness account? Well, it's basically he's going to tell you everything he saw, heard from Jesus, what he saw him do as far as the miraculous signs and wonders, what he heard, the voice from God in heaven, we hear that, and then the miracles that he did. He's going to give you his perspective in Matthew. The other thing that's very interesting about the Gospel of Matthew is he does focus his attention on Jesus' ancestral history. In other words, that he came in the line of David, that he, his Jewish heritage. And you'll see that through many things in the Gospels. When he talks specifically at the Sermon on the Mount, when he does this, Jesus is actually addressing some of the greatest challenges with the Levitical law. 
And that's why he says many times, you've heard it's been said. You've heard it's been taught. He's talking specifically about the Levitical law and its application. And Jesus is saying, you've heard it's been said, but I say. So Matthew is giving his eyewitness a testimony to Jesus's heritage and how Jesus felt about the Levitical law or the law of Moses. So he does a powerful job of showing that. So when you read Matthew, you are going to get a better sense of his lineage and how he addresses many things in the Mosaic law. Very powerful. So you pick up Matthew, you go, man, I'm going to get Matthew's perspective, but I'm also going to hear a lot of the end. Of Jesus was Jewish. You're going to see his Jewishness in a very strong way when you read the gospel of Matthew. Now, when you get to Mark, you get something very different. Well, who is Mark? Mark was not an eyewitness. Mark was someone who came later after the resurrection. But what is Mark? Why, well, why is Mark writing about the life of Jesus? Well, when you go to the late first century, there's a historian named Papias. And Papias is the one that set, that tells us about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as the writers. But he also says something specific about Mark. He says, Mark sat down and wrote what? Peter's memoirs. So when he speaks about the gospel according to Mark, he actually says, no, what Mark did was sit down with Peter and allow Peter to tell the story. Very powerful. Well, how do we, can, is there any confirmation of this outside of Papias? Well, when you read in the, in the book of Acts, Peter gets arrested and Herod wants him dead. But when he escapes by the angel, he gets out, guess where he goes? He goes to this woman named Mary, who is the mother of Mark, and it says it in the text. And that's where Peter gets his connection with Mark. He's one of Mark's really good friends. And matter of fact, when Peter writes about Mark in 2 Peter, he says, I'm like a father to Mark. So Mark knew Peter very well. And so when you read the gospel according to Mark, it's Peter's memoirs. The thing that's interesting is when you read through Mark, he mentions the name Peter more than anyone else in any of the other gospels. The other thing that you're going to see when he talks about areas they are that they go and they do, it's all from the perspective of the lake, of water and fishing. Why? Peter was a fisherman. And you see this narrative from the beginning all the way up to Jesus' arrest, and then all of a sudden, Peter plays a back role. Why? Because when P Jesus was arrested, Peter fleed. And then all of a sudden, Mark gives detail according to the women that witnessed everything when Peter ran. Very powerful. So when you read Mark, you're going to gain a perspective from Peter's perspective. And it's very powerful. You look at the crucifixion. When Jesus dies, in Mark's uh, description of it, which is from Peter's perspective, when Jesus gives up his last breath, the last thing he says is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then he dies. The other gospels, they give a different, they give more details. But in, in Peter's rendition of it, all he focuses on is what Jesus said, why have you forsaken me? Why is that significant? Well, think about it. What did Peter do when Jesus was arrested? He forsake the Lord. He denied even knowing him. So when he tells the story of Jesus' crucifixion, what really stuck out to him in his perspective? That Jesus was on the cross, and when he died, he says, God, why have you forsaken me? And we know when we read the scripts that Peter wept bitterly over his denial. And that just, wow, boy, such a great insight. But gaining perspective on that is only from when you read Mark. Why? Because it's Peter's perspective. Matthew had a different perspective on that. Why? He's a different person, and we're getting a fuller picture, a well-rounded picture of Jesus by having Matthew versus Mark. Well, let's talk about Luke. Well, who is Luke? Luke was not an eyewitness either. Both Mark and Luke were not eyewitnesses. Matter of fact, Luke, in, his, in chapter 1, verse 1, he says, look, many have undertaken this, and I'm going to give an orderly account 
from those that were first eyewitnesses. So he specifically says, I'm going to give an orderly account of the life of Jesus from those that are firsthand eyewitnesses. Well, when Luke writes this, there's 120 at least of those that were eyewitnesses to from the beginning all the way to the crucifixion. Now, that second group of eyewitnesses, I didn't forget, is a group of about 500, and all they saw was the resurrected Lord. So you got two groups, a group of 120 and a group of 500. The group of 120 saw Jesus' whole ministry all the way up to his resurrection, and a group of 500 that were just eyewitnesses to his resurrection. Well, Luke says, I'm going to interview, if you will, all of those eyewitnesses. So what Luke says he's going to do is I'm going to take the accounts of all the eyewitnesses. Now, Luke gets criticized as being, well, 80% of Luke is copied from Mark. And so they just go, well, he just copied from Mark. Well, why? why what's the problem with that? Well, you got to understand, Luke says, I'm going to get as many of the eyewitnesses as I can to tell the story. Well, Mark's um, gospel is Peter's eyewitness account. So Luke says, well, I want that. That's, I want that. Plus, I'm going to add those other 120 or so and get their perspective. That's why Luke's gospel is so long. Not only is it so long, he names 50 individuals, 49, I believe it is, outside of the 12, which is the most of all of the gospels. Why? Because he said, I'm going to go and interview. So Peter may tell the story of um, Lazarus rising from the dead, but Luke is going to go not only give you Peter's perspective, but Lazarus, Lazarus' sisters, and those that were eyewitnesses of it. And he's going to give us a fuller picture. And that's a powerful thing because now you've got not just one person's view, You've got multiple individuals that were there, and you get a fuller picture of all the events that are ascribed in the gospel. That is very powerful. Now, how do we know what Luke copied? It? Well, when you read in Colossians chapter 4, Paul talks about some of the best friends that he's with and sends greetings. Well, guess who he names? He names Mark and Luke. They were traveling with the apostle Paul together and they were friends. And that's that's how they, they connected. And that's how Luke was able to get the full version of Mark's gospel to make it into his. Very powerful and compelling when you look at the scriptures. Now, when you go to John, what's John's thing? John is very unique. John's gospel is unique in that what he focuses on is not all the miracles, but he literally focuses on the essence of who Jesus is. He focused specifically on his divine nature, which is powerful. Well, why is that significant? Well, one, Jesus claimed to be Lord. He says, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so John is going to give us demonstrations of that in the life of Jesus prior to the resurrection. He also is the closest confidant of Jesus. Even at the Last Supper, when Jesus said, someone is going to betray me, Peter leans over to him and says, hey, man, you ask him, he will tell you. Why? He was the closest confidant of Jesus. So it makes sense that he can tell you the very essence of who Jesus is. So if you're looking to understand the divine nature of who Jesus is, John's gospel clearly lays that out. He says, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And in verse John chapter 8, he says, who do you think you are, Jesus? He says, I am. These are powerful statements, powerful demonstrations of who he is. John 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, the Word became flesh. You'll see throughout John's narrative, from his perspective, he's going to show you the divine nature of Jesus. And when you read in 1 John, watch what he says in chapter 1. In 1 John chapter 1, he says, what I have seen with my eyes, what I have heard, and what my hands have touched, I proclaim to you. 
So we see John's, even in his old age, what he is making reference to is what his eyes have seen, what he has heard, and what he has touched, he proclaims to you. So those are the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, what happens when you get into the book of Acts? Well, when you get into the book of Acts, things change a little bit. Now you've got Luke, who is an eyewitness to the first century church. The book of Acts, if you want to get a healthy understanding of what the first century church looked like, read the book of Acts. It's about 25 to 30 year history of the beginning of the church. And it's very powerful. Luke had his hands involved in many of it because he traveled with the apostle Paul. So he saw a lot of the manifestation of God's church, how people lived. And so he documents it. And he says at the beginning, in my former book, Theopolis, I wrote all that was done with Jesus up until the day he was taken up into the Lord. And he says, I've given you these things so that they may give you full assurance of your faith. And then now he tells the story of the church and it's very powerful. So if you wanna know what the first century church looked like, if you're out there trying to find a church, read the book of Acts. And this is Luke, a historian who traveled with the apostle Paul and here is what he saw, and he records it all in the book of Acts. It's very compelling, very powerful, and he was an eyewitness to those events in the first century church. So imagine you've got someone that you can sit down and interview and say, man, what was the church like? What were the people like? What did they do? How did they live? How did they deal with persecution and the challenges? Wow, it is magnificent in every way. Now we move to the epistles, right? So we get to the Apostle Paul. Well, the Apostle Paul comes on the scene, and he wrote 13 of the letters in the epistles, 13 of them. That's a lot of writing. Now, when he's written these, many critics won't give him credit for all 13. Critics will say, you know, oh, he didn't write this, there's forgeries, this and that. But they will say seven of those 13 absolutely are written by the Apostle Paul. Now, these are the atheist scholars that are out there. They will tell you, well, seven of them he definitely wrote. That's 1 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Corinthians. That's Philemon. It's the book of Romans. That's um, Philippians and uh, Phil uh, Philippians and Philemon, I think. I, did I say Romans? I think I got that. Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians. I think I got them all. Uh, seven of them that they say he wrote. Now, what is the significance of the Apostle Paul? Well, he gets converted about three years after the resurrection of Jesus. Three years after the resurrection, he starts preaching the gospel for three years, and then he goes and meets with the Apostle Peter and John. He goes back and meets with them, uh, um, and he meets with them on two separate occasions, Peter, James, and John. And then Peter and James on one occasion, and uh, he gets acquainted with them. They are on the same page about the missionary work and the gospel message. Galatians chapter one and Galatians chapter two says that. So what we get from Paul's writings, Paul had been converted on the road to Damascus. And Jesus says, I'm going to appoint you to go to the Gentile community. What is that? The non-Jewish community I'm sending you as an apostle to them. And so what we get is some of the earliest writings in the entire New Testament from the Apostle Paul. First Thessalonians is dated to about 15 years after the resurrection. Wow, 15 years after the resurrection. The next one, first and second Corinthians, you're talking 20 years. This is powerful. So you're going to get in these letters, the Apostle Paul, as he's gone out and established churches all over the Roman Empire, and then he's going to write back to these churches things that he had that are concerns in his heart for them, questions that they have about their faith and how to live. And he writes these 13 epistles in that way. Now, these 13 epistles are written, so if you see Ephesus and you say, man, he writes to the church here in Ephesians, 
which is Ephesus. And you go, what was, well, where did that church start? Well, you go to Acts chapter 19 and you can see when that church actually started. And now you can see a letter that he writes back to that church that gives you some powerful things. Corinth, you see in uh, Corinth where he went there and proclaimed the message and got into a lot of trouble there. Uh, wound up going to court and there was a huge riot that breaks out. They beat up this gentleman named Sosthenes who was out against the apostle Paul. But then what happens there? Well, you read that story in Acts, but when he writes first and second Corinthians, guess what? When he writes back to the Corinthian church, he says, our brother Sosthenes sends you greetings. In other words, the one Sosthenes that was persecuting the apostle Paul after he was beaten up, he got converted and became a traveling mate with the Apostle Paul. Powerful, stunning story. So when you read any of those 13 epistles, you can go back to the book of Acts and find out how that church got started. And it gives you greater insight than when you read in Ephesians what he's saying to them. You go, wow, or Philippians, any of these. So this is Paul giving you uh, his eyewitness account with these churches, these individuals, and the great work that he did for Jesus as being the missionary apostle to the Gentile community. Then we get our brother Peter, right? First and second Peter, very powerful towards the end of Peter's life. The thing that's compelling about first and second Peter is this is the end of Peter's life. And when you look at the end of Peter's life, we know from John's gospel, it talks about Peter knowing his pending death is coming, and it's a very challenging thing for him to go to his death for the gospel message. But when you read First and Second Peter, you see in Peter a resolute attitude. He even says, my time has come to an end. God, the Lord has made this clear. And you see his confidence, his willingness to die. You see the transformed life in him. And wow, it is compelling knowing that when Jesus was arrested, he ran. And due to fear, he wasn't willing to die. But now towards the end of his life, when you read First and Second Peter, boy, is it like you, wow, amazing in every way. It's just powerful. You look at James. Now you get the book of James, a very powerful book. Why? Well, this was Jesus's brother. This was his biological brother, James, who served as an elder in the first century church. Well, what's powerful about James? Well, one, when Jesus began his ministry, James thought he was out of his mind. James did not believe him. James was a critic and thought Jesus had lost his mind. But after the resurrection, Jesus appeared to James, and Paul tells us this. And I believe that transformed his life. And now here's James serving as an elder, a shepherd of God's church. He writes the letter in James, and it is powerful. It is a powerful, strong uh, uh, challenge to the church not to become worldly. And you, and you know he's strong in it because of what? Because in his life, he rejected Jesus. So now on the back end, he had deep convictions to address those of us that become worldly in our walk with God. Very powerful. But you get a, a bird's eye view from James, the brother of Jesus. Wow. He grew up with Jesus. He knew him as a young man, and he also knew him as an adult. And then he knew him as the Messiah. And boy, does he write a compelling story. Jude. Guess who Jude is? Jude is also the other biological brother of Jesus. He was known historically as a teacher in the first century. This is one of Jesus's other brothers. And he writes a compelling story again, both of his brothers. They warn us against worldliness and allowing our emotions to get the best of us and corrupt our faith. But Jude grew up with Jesus, knew Jesus as a child, as a young adult, and also the messianic king, Jesus. So he knew him and he writes about him. So when you read Jude and James, wow, powerful descriptions in every way. Now, you also, you know, we know that they preach the gospel uh, 
in the synagogues initially. And sometimes we always wonder, wonder what they preach, because many times you can see, like Apollos, no one could stand up with him. He proved from the Old Testament scriptures that what? Jesus was the Messiah. We're like, man, I wish I heard those sermons. Well, guess where those sermons, sermons are written down in? The book of Hebrews. Hebrews, there's much controversy on folks don't know who actually wrote it. And the reason for that is that it's not written like any of the other epistles. It's written more like sermon notes. That's, that's how it's written. And what many scholars believe is that the book of Hebrews is simply a collection of sermons put together in a letter format. Why? Well, because they believe that when folks were in the synagogues proclaiming Jesus was the Messiah from the Old Testament, these were the sermons that they were saying. And when you look at Hebrews, it is constantly going to the Old Testament, constantly pulling out the scriptures from the Old Testament. Well, where did they get these scriptures from? Well, in Luke, Luke chapter 24, verses 44 and following, Luke interviews the 11, and he says, what was Jesus saying to you guys after the resurrection? And he writes, he opened our minds so we could understand the, the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, all of them speaking about his life, death, burial, and resurrection. And in Hebrews, you get this whole sermon collection and it's powerful. So if you want to know what they were preaching and how they were proving Jesus was the Messianic King from the Old Testament, read the book of Hebrews. Very compelling. I also personally think Paul wrote it. Why? He's a scholar of whoever wrote it had to have apostolic authority, and they definitely had to be a scholar of the Old Testament. But at the end of Hebrews, guess what he says? The writer says, hey, I will send Timothy to you. And we all see the relationship between Paul and Timothy. It is so profound in the New Testament. So my personal opinion is, I believe Paul wrote it. I really do. Very powerful. Then we get to John, right? So John has written 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and Revelation. Well, what do you get here? You're getting John at the end of his life, you know, 90 some years old. He's able to look back on his life. He's able to look back on the things that were said and taught. And he's able to give great wisdom and insight into that. And so we get 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and he talks so much about love, imitation of Christ, who we are to be in Christ, and it's powerful. Why? He had the best relationship with Christ. He was close to him. He understood God's love in Christ, and so he writes about it very powerfully. Then you get to Revelation, and it's clear he's the last of them standing. And it makes sense that he issues out warnings to the seven churches. Why? He's about to depart this world, and he doesn't want the church to become corrupted. And so we get revelations. Then we get the hope of revelation, which is the ending of, if you will, the New Testament story, which is really a visionary description of the many challenges that came upon man, whether it be earthly tragedies and disasters whether it be warring factions against one another, or whether it be the worldliness and materialism and sexual uh, perversions of the world, each of those three areas are set to take us out. In each of those scenarios, he proclaims the lamb is the victory. The risen king is the victory. And that is our hope as he closes out his life. Wow, guys, this is powerful. So know the writers, know who they are, and that'll give you great insight. The second principle that I think will help you and transform your, your understanding of the Bible and the reading is outside resources. And I've got a few. This one, the first one that I want to give to you is Hard Sayings of the Bible. Hard Sayings of the Bible. I'll put the link in uh, the description below. This is a great book. Four scholars, uh, modern day scholars wrote it. You know, if you read in the Bible, let's say you look at uh, 1 Samuel 15, God commands them to destroy everyone, including the women and kids. It's a hard text. This goes through the Bible and gives you a, a full contextual understanding of what was happening there. When the prophet was coming out and they called him bald-headed, and it says these children uh, mocked him, and then bears came out and mauled him. You go, oh, God's mauling children. Well, they give you a much better understanding of what was actually happening there contextually, and a translation that helps you to see they weren't children. 
These were a bunch of wild bandits that were doing some things they shouldn't be doing. But this is a great book. I'll put the link in the description. This is an outside resource that when you're reading and you come across a passage that you don't understand, it's probably in this book. And that's going to help you out tremendously. Uh, another book that I use um, is I, I wanted to be an archaeologist when I was a kid. And this is Titus Kennedy's book. Uh, and it's an archaeological uh, evidence book that proves uh, the time of Jesus, the life and time of Jesus, and many of the things that are written about in the New Testament. These are great resources because people want to say, oh, he never lived. And this, this book goes after that, and it deals with some of the things that are outside of the Bible that give you references on. He has a second book as well, Unearthing the Bible. This goes through the Old Testament, Dr. Titus Kennedy. I'll put the links in the description as well. This is a great book that goes through the Old Testament. Folks say Moses, uh, the Exodus never happened. That's a lie. Well, he goes into some archaeological discoveries that will blow your mind, that are really powerful. He goes through the whole Old Testament, and it's great. It's great outside resources to help heighten your understanding of things that are in the Bible. And then the last one is by uh, Ber Berceau, uh, A Dictionary of Early Christian Beliefs. Um, you know, what people don't understand is there are about 30,000 documents that are written after the first century of Christians writing to each other. And we have those documents. And what he did is he put them in a topical study, a topical study, so that if you want to know what those in the second century, what they, how they understood repentance, you open up to repentance, and he's got letters from individuals from the late first century, early second century, that were writing to each other about the subject of repentance. They're quoting scriptures on things. You want to know what they thought about faith or what they thought about um Infant baptism, which you'll see, they don't. <laughs> um, just some powerful documents. This is not the Word of God, but it's outside resources of people that were close enough to the Scripture writings and how they saw the writings and then their application of it. And boy, they have some deep convictions that are very compelling. And, and I tell you this, you know, this is how you really can begin a great journey in your faith. Understand who the writers are and what their intended purpose is and getting outside resources to augment your reading. And I'm telling you, you'll have a powerful time in God's word and it will transform you. I'll put the links in the descriptions. If you have any questions, please let me know. I'll get back to you as best I can. Take care and have a great day.